Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you doing this morning? Doing quite well, thank you. Our returning viewers will remember that Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Baer Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines and our lone U.S. COVID statistic through today, June 27th. We invite you to submit your questions down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with our abbreviated COVID statistic, average COVID deaths per day in the past week were 32.5, and in 2023, the same week, we saw 90. Your reaction to those numbers, Dr. Murphy? It's stable. Uh, for the last few weeks, um, the death rate is basically the only thing we can follow now, and it's the only thing that's reportable. But it still amounts to 11,888 deaths per year. So, I mean, this thing has not gone away, so it's mm -hmm. And can you give us a little follow-up on the KP variants that we were talking about in terms of dominance? Yeah, so there's this um, um, part of the Omicron family is uh, a group uh, that uh, <laughs> is called FLIRT. Um, and they all come from the JN1 variant. And um, these are um, K, uh, KP2 and KP3 in particular. And KP2 had been ahead and now KP3 is ahead and KP2 is going down. Uh, and then there's another one that's popped up called LB1, uh, which is accounting for about 17.5% of all the cases. So these are all related, but the, the virus is, continues to involve, evolve. So as we mentioned last week, um, the, the, uh, the recommendation now is that the new vaccine that's gonna come out in uh, September should be based on these KP2, KP3 variants. Um, and not on the JN1, because the JN1 was like the parent, and now there's hardly any of the JN1 now. So it was a big comment by the FDA. Um, Peter Marks, in particular, said we should go after the, the one that's happening now. There's no point uh, to do the other one. So that's what's happening now. So these are, you know, each one is beats out the other one. That's why it changes. So they, it gets kind of more and more infectious. It uh, doesn't look any more severe, um, but it's really more for designing the next uh, vaccine, which is now all taking place. Now, the um, Novavax is, uh, vaccine is, I, is still going to um, look at the JN1 because they've already started it and it's, it's not as easy to change the technology. So there'll be actually two different vaccines approved in the fall. New one. That'll be very interesting to see. But while we're on the vaccine front, just yesterday, there was a very big announcement regarding the RSV vaccine. And we had a question about this last week, so we've got to follow up. Can you tell us what the announcement was? Yeah, so there's uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, is uh, another potentially deadly virus to kill up to 10,000 adults per year and children as well, uh, as well get sick, not so many die, a few hundred. But I mean, still, they, the, for pediatrics, they fill up the um, ICUs and uh, the pediatric beds um, because they get so sick. So it's kids under one for the most part. So anyhow, uh, in adults, um, there's uh, Pfizer and GSK both have a vaccine. Uh, the Pfizer one was approved for 60 and over, and the GSK one just got approved for 50 and older. But the advisory committee, um, to the CDC and the director, Mandy Cohen, agrees that because of the incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is rare, 16 cases per million for the Pfizer and three cases per million for the uh, GSK vaccine, that they're going to change the guidelines 
um, right now for who should get the vaccine. It wasn't just everybody 60 and up. Uh, and now they're saying from 60 to 74, it's a, you should have a discussion with your doctor based on your current health condition. If you have some kind of chronic disease that would you would do worse with a bad pneumonia, take it. Like I, I, I took it because uh, I, I was, I'm over 60. Uh, don't have really any other health problems. So, but now it's, they're going, you should have that discussion, discussion with your doctor. And then 75 and up, it's recommended for everybody. Mm -hmm. So the public health people don't typically don't like those kind of recommendations because people get confused. Should I take it? Now take it. You know, the, half the doctors will say, yeah, take it. Don't take it. You know I mean? Like they don't know uh, necessarily why this is happening, but it's because of this slight increase in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now everyone doesn't die from Guillain-Barre and it usually just gets better on its own, but it is still considered a serious disease. So it's based on uh, on the side effect profile, but six mm -hmm. million doses is the worst, a lot. worst case scenario. And it does, it just happen also, but that's higher than what's expected. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that update. And moving on to another vaccine that was just approved, not for COVID, but this time, or RSV, excuse me, but this time for pneumonia, a second pneumonia vaccine. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, this is big news. Um, the FDA approved the 21 valent pneumococcal vaccine by Merck. The name of the vaccine is Cap Vaccine. Um, so pneumococcal pneumonia, this is the regular bacterial pneumonia. It's caused by, caused by a bacteria um, bacterium called Streptococcus pneumoniae. All right, that's what we get, Streptococcal pneumonia, we, we call it. Anyway, there's a hundred different serotypes, like types of that bacteria that can cause disease in humans. And the serotypes that the Merck vaccine uh, impacts uh, account for 84% of those invasive pneumonia bacteria compared to Prevnar, which is a very good vaccine, but it only only covers 52%. So you have a better mousetrap here. You, you've got a, you have a vaccine with uh, a broader coverage. So um, it's somewhat of a game changer. It's a, it's a better product, more effective, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. And speaking of game changers, one of the most exciting studies that I have seen in a very long time was just released regarding a phase three trial currently ongoing in Western Africa with HIV in young women. Can you tell us about the findings in this study? Yeah, so this is a study um, that was done in uh, South Africa and Uganda with a drug called lenacapavir. It's a capsid inhibitor, different kind of mechanism that is approved already for people who failed all the current treatments. So they got approval to use it as a treatment. Now it's when you give it under the skin, like you give um, insulin, subcutaneous, um, it stays in the body for a long time, um, like six months. So they did a phase three, that's an advanced study, Double blind, randomized. So this is a very strongly powered study in 5,300 women and adolescent girls in South Africa and Uganda. Um, and um, they only had to take it twice a year. And they uh, compared it to a group taking once daily Descovy. And a third group was once daily Truvada. These are pills that are used to treat HIV, but given before you have HIV, prevent HIV. It's called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So since we don't have a vaccine and people are still at risk for getting HIV, pre-exposure prophylaxis and people at risk is very important. 
So what happened? So in the Truvada group during this uh, study, there were 16 cases of HIV in the people taking Truvada. There were 39 incident infections in the people taking the SCOBY. And in the 2,134 women taking the injection, lencapivir, there were none, zero. Now, is it a better drug? Well, it's a more effective drug because the drug level stays for six months. And so you only have to have this injection every six months. The trouble with Discovi and Truvada is it works great if you take it, but you know, take, you're talking about taking a pill every day and somebody who's otherwise healthy. So, you know, maybe they forget to take it or they don't want to take it with it. Because in other studies, this one they're still analyzing, but in other studies, they showed the same thing. And the people that got infected with HIV were not necessarily taking their, their pills correctly, or they stopped taking them for some reason. Um, so it was really more a drug exposure problem. And when you give it subcutaneously, it's, it's like you'd only have to have a pill once every six, or you don't have to have a shot once every six months. And there was nothing, nobody got infected. It, it's just, it's a, it's really a critical choice and, uh, and to use in PrEP. Now, whether this is going to, how it's going to get approved here in the United States, we'll see. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens uh, in other population groups, because this is a group in high-risk women. Mm -hmm. And some absolutely astonishing results there. We will be keeping our eye out for any more announcements or research in this realm. Mm -hmm. But if we switch gears back to a very popular topic, the avian flu, there have been, of course, no more human cases, we're happy to say, but there have been some updates on our preparedness side as a country. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, back and forth talking about, you know, they're, we're not prepared for the next pandemic and, you know, WHO has a plan. And, you know, so finally we have the U.S. Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, that's a group, laid out their plans uh, for the uh, avian flu uh, infections affecting U.S. cattle and poultry. So um, they have made... PPE, personal protective equipment, all the gear you weigh, have to wear to avoid getting this. Antiviral drugs, including, including Tamiflu. Uh, and an order of over 4 million vaccines, which already exist and are approved. And they put it into the strategic national stockpile for use and in the case that human to human transmission occurs. So there's only been three confirmed human cases of avian flu, and they were all in dairy farm workers. Uh, there was a case in Mexico where the person died. They don't know how he, that person got infected. Um, so the risk of infection to the public is generally low. And um, um, people are also advised not to drink unpasteurized milk because it's been found, avian flu virus has been found in milk, but pasteurization kills it. So the pasteurization is a good idea right now to drink milk. Um, since the onset of the recent avian flu outbreak, which started in 2022, over 97 million birds have been affected in 48 U.S. states. 123 six herds of cattle have been affected in 12 states. So they know um, that uh, the uh, these vaccines. Um, about two dozen companies uh, are trying to develop vaccines for animals, um, but uh, they're going to take some time before they can prove that that has really worked. Um, so, um, yeah, the uh, uh, prior testing in 297 retail dairy samples have not shown live virus, uh, and they're going to continue to test all sorts of products. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure, though, as sure. you noted, right. pasteurization has been seeming to work thus far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, 
mosquitoes, mosquitoes, mosquitoes. They are huge vectors for disease here and worldwide. Dengue in particular is seeing a historic year. Can you continue to tell us about it? Yeah, so US health officials are warning doctors to be alert for dengue <clears throat> as uh, we're at really record levels of uh, dengue disease. Uh, it's it remains less common in the continental United States, but so far this year there have been three times as many cases at the same point as last year. So we don't have too many, but it tripled is basically what happened. So in the Americas in general, south of the United States, um, in the last year, they had over nine million cases reported which was twice as many as the year before. So this is in, uh, so the seasons are a little bit different, you know, down there uh, when you get uh, south of the equator. So, but regardless, the numbers are, have just increased dramatically. Um, Puerto Rico has problem, the Caribbean, Mexico, uh, all, all sorts of other places. And as the climate warms somewhat, those mosquitoes, can uh, actually spread. We've even had de novo cases as we've reported in Florida and California and probably other states mm -hmm. as well. So it's just a warning, it's a threat and uh, we have to watch for it. There are vaccines for it. So vaccines have been used in Brazil in particular um, and we'll see what happens in the United States. Mm -hmm. And on that note, our final story of the day, also about mosquitoes, but a different virus, the West Nile virus, which has been detected more than we would like in Las Vegas. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so <clears throat> climate change and, and climatic events have had a huge impact on uh, the spread of other viruses, including West Nile virus. So West Nile can cause meningitis and people can get very sick from it. And they found a whole uh, lot increase anyway in West Nile virus in 169 pools um, across 25 Southern Las Vegas zip codes. So um, Las Vegas seems to be having a big bump up in West Nile uh, virus. And, um, you know, there had been a vaccine developed for it. Nobody wanted to take it and it just sat there and expired. Uh, but uh, there's a, this basically potential big outbreak uh, due to the changes in the weather uh, in the Las Vegas area right now. So people going to Las Vegas, somehow you get sick when you get back. You should think West Nile virus is one of the possibilities. People just get sick. Mm -hmm. It's a real bad flu, but it can be just headache and fever. And uh, it's uh, it, it can be quite... Uh, quite serious. Yeah, and it's very good that these things are being talked about, pushed out there, and doctors are being warned, knowing that these things are spreading and could be in their patients. So on that note, thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for breaking down all these headlines for us, all your time and expertise. It is much appreciated. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. We hope to see you again next week. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggested topics you would like to see Dr. Murphy address, please feel free to leave them down in our comment section or at any of our social media linked in the description. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.